Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of The Casual Criminalist. I, as always, am your host, Simon. What happens here is Callum has written me a script. I'm going to read the scripts. Jen, afterwards, is going to add in some atmospheric music and all of that stuff. Uh, this is a full length long episode if you're new here we do one full length a week and we do one short one also if you're listening to this on as a podcast it's also available on youtube if you're watching on youtube it's also available as a podcast isn't that fun this is the acid bath murderer no body no crime not quite uh, we had a previous casual criminalist i think is it the state of texas where it was really hard to get convictions unless there was a body uh when you killed someone or like not you personally dear listener but if you you know if someone wants to kill someone it sounds like now i'm just covering up for the fact that i've killed people but I, I i haven't i don't think but in texas they had this no body no crime which seems just a little bit insane but uh let's just see where this goes shall we i'm gonna guess people are gonna get dissolved in acid which is lovely buckle in <laughs> Legal loopholes can be a godsend when you find yourself on the wrong side of the law. Rather than go to all the trouble of proving your innocence, you can simply swagger out of the courtroom on a technicality and get on with your life. Yeah, <laughs> legal loopholes, godsend. Uh, <laughs> not quite right. Maybe you just got out of an arrest because the officer forgot to read your rights as he slammed your face into the car bonnet or dodged a traffic ticket by declaring yourself a sovereign citizen outside the reach of the law. <laughs> I'd like to see that one work. It's like, I am not a citizen. <laughs> It's not gonna it's not gonna work you're paying that ticket the only problem with loopholes though is the more often than not they turn out to be total bullshit as in both of the examples above so if a criminal were to for some reason base his whole strategy on one of these legal old wives tales he'd be in for a rude awakening before the judge such was the case with john george haig a serial killer who inter who attempted to beat the law at his own game only to have the smirk slapped off his face in spectacular fashion a man of many faces Let's jump right midway. It's 1937. We're in the offices of solicitor William Cato Adamson on London's Chancery Lane. Famous. Oh, this is in the UK. I don't know. I kind of assumed, I guess, acid bath made me think of Breaking Bad and made me think of America. Um, but we're in the good old UK where I'm from. Adamson is a picture of professionalism, sporting a tailored suit, neatly slicked back hair, and his unfortunate Hitlery moustache, which would remain in vogue for a few years yet. Not for long, it's 1937. <laughs> Business is booming for the high-flying solicitor, so much so that he can afford to keep officers in Guildford and Hastings as well. Aside from his regular legal business, he makes, it a good, he makes a good chunk of income from stocks and shares inherited from his grateful clients, which he sells at cut rate. One of Adamson's prospective customers received a letter from him that year, offering another batch of shares at prices which seemed too good to be true because they were. This eagle-eyed investor noticed that Adamson had made a spelling mistake on the letterhead, leaving the D out of Guildford. That's, well, I mean, <laughs> come on. So, of course, they do what we all do when we spot a spelling error, and they called the police. Okay. <laughs> It'd be like people calling the police on me when I get a pronunciation wrong. They, well, one, they're not going to care, but if people did, the police would never leave my home. This would prove to be one of the few times a grammar Nazi has made a positive contribution to the world because Adamson's letters were in fact part of an elaborate scam. These were the 1930s equivalent of a Nigerian prince email, meaning that the stocks and even the lawyer himself were completely fraudulent. When the police raided his premises, they discovered that there were never any other officers and his name wasn't even Adamson. He'd have to be a bit of an idiot if he was like, yeah, no, my name is actually Adamson. Come on, it's not like the Nigerian prince's name is actually prince whatever. It was John George Haig, a convicted fraudster whose rap sheet reads like a scrapped first draft for Catch Me If You Can, which is a fantastic movie that I love. Early Days Born in 1909 in Stamford, Lincolnshire, John was raised in a fundamentalist Christian sect named the Plymouth Brethren. Think Amish! just less hardcore. Nowadays, their followers shun computers, TV, radio, university, political elections, and basically any live entertainment beyond singing hymns with your grandparents. That life sounds awesome. Not really. It's like all of the fun stuff, and I'm betting like 
going to the pub is not one of the things they are actually allowed to do. This kind of ultra strict religious upbringing basically seems like a prerequisite for serial killers, so please take a moment to check that one off your bingo cards right now. Haig grew up with the fire and brimstone preaching of his fundamentalist father who he inherited his name from. John Senior claimed that the blue birthmark on his own head was the sign of the devil which God had cursed him with for sinning as a young man. Ah, religious fundamentalism. They put the fun in fundamentalism. <laughs> Young John was terrified of one day looking in the mirror to find a similar mark of his own, but as the years went on and his holy misdemeanors piled up, none ever appeared. To the impressionable young Bible basher, this proved that he was exempt from morality. He could sin as he pleased, save from the judgment of God and the eyes of his father. And anyway, John Sr. was far more concerned with the sinners outside of his household. He built a high fence all the way around the family home to keep out the wickedness of the world, meaning his son only had his pets for company throughout his early years. So he turned it into a prison. <laughs> Good one. This, you know, recipe for well-balanced adults uh, is, a, is a childhood like this. According to him, his isolation and paralyzing fear of damnation led to recurring nightmares throughout his childhood, featuring surreal religious imagery. He later described a reawakening of those dreams after a car crash in 1944. Uh, by which time, that hit the mustache well out of fashion. I saw before me a forest of crucifixes which gradually turned into trees. At first there appeared to be dew or rain dripping from the branches, but as I approached I realized it was blood. The whole forest began to writhe and the trees darkened erect to ooze blood. A man went from each tree catching the blood. When the cup was full he approached me. Drink, he said, but I was unable to move. But despite being plagued by Black Sabbath album covers each night, the young man became a relatively successful student. He landed scholarships at Queen Elizabeth's Grammar School and Wakefield Cathedral, where he served as a choir boy. Since his sheltered upbringing made him something of an outcast, John dedicated thousands of hours to mastering the piano throughout his school years and developed a prodigious knowledge of classical music. His first few cons. Despite his miserable troubled childhood, John remained a pious member of the Brethren throughout his teens and early twenties. His rebellious phase had been repressed until then, so it was about to burst forth in spectacular fashion. At 21, when he was suspected of stealing cash from a motor engineering firm where he worked, he was fired. It was basically all downhill from there. I have to say, like, stealing cash already sounds like the downhill has begun. <laughs> In 1934, John met his wife-to-be, Beatrice Hammer, and stopped attending church with his parents. He married Beatrice that same year, despite barely even knowing her. To fund their new life together, he decided to put his knowledge of cars to a different use, forging tax and ownership documents for vehicles. He was caught in the act later that year and sentenced to 15 months for fraud. John's new bride gave birth to his daughter while he was in prison, but he never got the chance to meet her. Beatrice had already filed for divorce. She decided to give her newborn up for adoption rather than face the stigma of raising her as a single mother back in the days when they were largely shunned by society. And predictably, imprisonment, adoption, and divorce typically don't fly too well with fundamentalist Christians back then either. Well, don't commit crimes and go to prison. If you're in prison 15 months, I don't blame your wife for divorcing you. Also, she doesn't have to be super religious just because you are. So John was excommunicated from his faith and family from then on. After serving 15 months, he set about trying to rebuild his shattered life with mixed success. John started a dry cleaning business with a longtime friend. No, it wasn't a clever scam to switch out Prada dresses for cheap knockoffs. The business was actually completely legit, but unfortunately, it fell apart when his partner died in a car crash. I have to say, if, like, a friend of mine from the past had just served 15 months in prison for stealing and fraud, uh, well, he had a reputation for stealing and then was convicted of fraud, I'd be like, listen, mate, <laughs> I'm going to start a business with someone else because you're a convicted fraudster. That's when John decided to up sticks for London. At first, he worked as a driver and a maintenance man to millionaire William McSwan, who made his money running amusement arcades. I feel like millionaire back in the day used to mean a lot more. That's like, I mean, houses like a house. It's like half a million. Easy. Doesn't mean what it used to. Then came the fake solicitor episode we started with, for which he served four years, and a further conviction for fraud less than a year and a half after his release. Graduating to murder. Although the mark of the devil had yet to appear on the young fraudster's head, he had more than a few blemishes on his impressive criminal record. But it's worth pointing out that John was by no means stupid. His schemes were sophisticated operations backed up by natural charm, which made him well suited to his life as a con man. I have to say, like the number of people we cover on Casual Criminalist, right? It's just like you who think they're smart and end up just making ridiculous mistakes. If you're a regular listener, 
you know it's super high. There was the Leopold and Loeb episode we did, <laughs> where it's like, you know, every article, you Google it and it's like, the genius killers. And it's like, we did this episode about them. It's like, they're not geniuses. They were like pretty dumb. They made some really stupid mistakes. They just thought they were geniuses. They were like, we're going to commit the perfect crime because we're geniuses. And then they commit a crime with an insane number of mistakes and then they go to prison. Like, And one of them dies there and the other's there for almost ever. It's like, dudes, you, come on, come on. The only problem was that sooner or later, his marks would wise up. If only he could somehow remove them from the equation altogether. Defrauding the living was clearly far too much hassle, and things went a lot more smoothly if he could simply kill his victims as he went along. But how to do that without landing back in jail for murder? He thought long and hard on that question during his latest prison stint, <laughs> delving into the prison library to figure out how he could best protect himself. Ah, yes, prisons, the breeding grounds for further crime. He skimmed through legal textbooks day after day, eventually finding the golden ticket that he needed. Corpus Delecti. Okie dokie. I'm guessing that is like the bod no body, no crime thing, which obviously isn't a thing. It's like, in the, even in that Texas example, it's not literally no body, no crime. Like if you murder someone, announce it, and then destroy the body, you're still going to go to prison. It's just a lot harder to prove it. John became so obsessed with the idea, it became his unofficial catchphrase in prison. Yeah, good luck with parole with that one. Oh yes, hello, I'm up for parole. My catchphrase is no body, no crime. <laughs> Whenever John, or old corpus delecti, as he became known, got a chance, he would rant to his fellow inmates about his little Latin legal loophole. Under that British law, if no body is found, then no murder conviction can take place. No body, no crime, and how better to get rid of a body than good old-fashioned acid baths? In this, he was inspired by the murders of French killer Georges Alexandre Sore, but unlike Georges Alexandre, John was no chemist. Then again, he was no lawyer either, and that never stopped him giving it a go. Except with chemistry, it's like, I mean, if you need to make acid, you're gonna need to know how. I mean, with lawyering, you need to know how to lawyer, but this guy wasn't lawyering, he was just pretending to be a lawyer and sending letters. He landed a job in the prison metal workshop, giving him access to sulfuric acid. I guess, although, you know, that's called acid, so you know. Which he tested on the corpses of mice killed around the prison. John discovered that, as we all know, it takes around 30 minutes to dissolve a whole mouse carcass in a tub of acid. I'm assuming Callum was being so acid that I don't think everyone knows that. By extrapolation, he figured a human body might take a night or two at most. That seems a bit optimistic. A mouse is really small, so it's all about surface area, right? The mouse has a really small surface area to volume ratio, whereas the human body has a much larger surface area, uh, much smaller. Smaller? Is that the right way around? Well, look, either way, it's going to take a lot longer. He poured, maybe it's not, maybe he, maybe it does take a night or two, I don't know. <laughs> it's not something I've looked up. As he poured the liquefied mouse down a drain, John smiled to himself. If he could replicate this psychotic little science project on a larger scale, he'd surely become one of the greatest criminals who had ever lived. <laughs> Good luck with that. The death and liquefaction of William McSwan. Oh, a millionaire! Upon his release in 1940, John found London very different from where he'd left it. World War II was in full swing, and the English capital had been divested by the bombing raids of the Blitz. I'm assuming Callum means devastated there. I don't think there was a lot of divesting going on. That's the kind of chaotic environment a budding murderer can really thrive in. So John started renting out a small basement workshop on Gloucester Road and stockpiling. At I'm not sure if that's Gloucestershire or Gloucester. I know one of maybe it's maybe it's just Gloucester, because Gloucestershire would have the the spelling of English places and counties is all very strange. So I, I it's Gloucester Road. That's definitely Gloucester, and no one cares. Let's move on. <laughs> and stockpiling acid for his first attempt at making human stew. Four years would pass before he got a chance to try his recipe. It was then that he went for a drink at a pub called The Goat Tavern in Kensington, one of the oldest watering holes in London. There he bumped into an old acquaintance, William McSwan, the wealthy Scottish-born Londoner who he had once driven for. The two men spent the evening getting reacquainted, but being in the company of wealth didn't sit too well with old Johnny Boy. He himself was a near-destitute ex-con living paycheck to paycheck, so presumably much of the night he was spent wondering whether or not his old employer could comfortably fit in a 40-gallon water barrel or not. Dude, he's so grim. The two men continued to meet up over the next few weeks, and McSwan even introduced Haig to his elderly parents, Donald and Amy. The couple were moneyed, and had recently invested a hefty chunk of their fortune into some London properties which were managed by their son. The opportunity seemed too good to be true. 
On the 9th of September 1944, Haig invited McSwan out for a drink at The Goat, getting his friends loaded up on wine before luring him to his workshop nearby. As McSwan turned his back to look around, John smashed the back of his skull with the leg of a pinball table and beat him until he was dead. As it turned out, McSwan fit very comfortably inside the barrel which John had set aside for the occasion. After getting suited up in a rubber apron and gloves, he began pouring in enough acid to fully cover the body. Once it was submerged, the fumes of the disintegrating flesh were too much to handle, and the killer had to run outside. Pulling his shirt over his mouth and nose, Haig was able to go back in long enough to fasten the cover onto the barrel of bubbling blood and acid, and then he went home. But he couldn't quite shake the image from his mind. <laughs> dude, if you could just shake that image from your mind. I know you're a psycho, but dude, <laughs> that is a sign that you are a bad person. If you get home and it's like, yeah, 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 let's uh, have a beer and watch some telly, you'll be fine. Nothing to worry about. The sight of that swirling, bloody broth revived his old childhood nightmares, and his dreams were once again filled with rivers of blood. Good, I mean, y good. When he awoke from that surrealist horror show, he felt like a new man. Believing he had committed the perfect crime, he went to visit McSwan's parents to tie up the loose ends. He told them their son, who was currently about 75% disintegrated, had been called up to join the war, but chose a life on the run as a draft dodger instead. Their AWOL offspring even sent them postcards from the Scottish Highlands over the following months, of course, all penned by Haig. In them, he confirmed that he wanted John to take over the collection of the rent from the London properties until his return. Also, it was fine if his mate wanted to crash at his swanky city centre apartment while he was gone as well. If I was the parents, I'd be like, this is mega suspicious. <laughs> Although they are old, so maybe they've got that old person brain. Or it's like, oh, lovely dear, yes, carry on. <laughs> so, I don't know. Like, I, I, my, my grandparents, the, the surviving ones, they're really old these days. They don't know what's up. Like, they, yeah, no, they, they could fall for this. Haig was sly enough that McSwan bought the story from the outset, trusting him to take care of their affairs until their son returned. Unbeknownst to them, shortly after leaving them, he poured the slop formerly known as William McSwan down a drain in the floor. And his parents. Oh no, is he going to dissolve the old people as well? Dude, come on. The con had gone off without a hitch, and Haig was able to maintain the ruse for almost an entire year. All that time, he enjoyed a luxury lifestyle on the money skims from the rental income, treating himself to a brand new car and a wardrobe of dapper suits. <clears throat> if people aren't getting suspicious at this point, it's like, come on, police, come on, old people. His good fortune would have lasted longer, but annoyingly, World War II was coming to a close, and the McSwans started to inquire why their William wasn't coming home, seeing as the military wasn't in need of him anymore. But he didn't go off to war, he went off into hiding. So I don't know if after the war, if you've like dodged the draft or whatever the equivalent was in World War II, then you're still going to be wanted for committing the crime of dodging the draft, right? So you could still logically be on the run even afterwards. With his house of cards starting to wobble, John knew that he had only a few weeks at most before his mark started to suspect that something was up. So in July 1945, he gave the elderly McSwans exactly what they wanted. Their son was coming back from Scotland, and he couldn't wait to be reunited with them at a workshop on Gloucester Road. When the couple descended into the dingy, damp little room, William was nowhere to be seen. This was a strange place for a family reunion, but their son was technically still a fugitive, Okay, there we go. Uh, Haig assured them that he would be along shortly. They should head on inside and make themselves comfortable. Mr. McSwan was the first to go, struck on the back of the head. His wife barely had time to scream before she too was bludgeoned on the floor. Haig beat his elderly victims repeatedly until both stopped moving. We can only hope that he had properly finished the job, because if not, the acid certainly would have. That is super grim. According to Haig's own testimony, it was then that he decided to act on the demands from his crucifix dreams. Drink, said the creepy guy with the cup of blood, and that's exactly what John did. Dude, what are you doing? No. This just went from, like, murder story to cannibalism. Um, I did not expect that. That is a grim turn of events. Did I say at the beginning that I don't read these before? I've never read this before. It's an exploration. And today, we have explored into the territory of cannibalism. Brilliant. Rather than toss the pair of pensioners into an acid bath right away, he first drained a cup of the red stuff from each and drank them down. I mean, when you've already gone past killing and dissolving people, you might as well. I'm not condoning vampirism, just pointing out the leap between acid baths and va vampirism isn't that big. Nah, I mean, this guy's a, this guy's psycho. Like, totally. <laughs> and the couple's remains were safely disposed of down the same drain as their son, and Haig took control of their affairs. This means telling their landlady that they'd suddenly decided to move to the United States and having their pension checks forwarded to their new suite at the Onslow Court Hotel in Kensington. Wait, they didn't want their pension checks forwarded to where they were in America? They just wanted them forwarded to a hotel in Kensington. Oh, it's so suspicious. How does no one check this? After forging William McSwan's signature to gain power of attorney over their estate, 
it can't be that simple. Getting power of attorney over a rich person's estate is just like, yeah, I forged a signature. Surely there's got to be like, who are those people who verify? Like, is it an apostle who verifies a signature or a lawyer? Or like, there's got to be more than just a signature, right? He disposed of their London properties, various securities, and the contents of their home in his name, netting nearly £4,000 in total, or about £170,000 in today's money. Wait, I thought they were super rich. Didn't they have many London properties? I mean, £170,000 doesn't buy you many London properties. It probably doesn't even buy you one London property on the outskirts of London. Very far outskirts of London. <laughs> Haig was moving up in the world. It turns out that the only thing needed to turn a failing con man career around was 10 gallons of acid and a can-do attitude. And the Hendersons. There was one more problem, though. John Haig wasn't quite as good at holding on to money as he was at swindling people out of it. Alongside his fancy new hotel home, he splashed the cash, impressing a new girlfriend named Barbara, and blew the rest on a crippling gambling addiction. I do feel like living in a hotel, like a fancy hotel, is like, you know, one of those ultimate flexes. It's like, yeah, no, I just live in a hotel. <laughs> it's pretty cool. I loved, uh, there's a TV show called Boston Legal, and one of the char- the main characters from that, he'd like sued his previous law firm or something for you know, because they didn't pay him. And he got so much money, he was just like, I don't want a house anymore. I'm just going to move into a hotel. It's like, that's pretty baller. By 1947, his funds were already running low and a few minor scams topped up his reserves. But what he needed was another big windfall. He began scoping out potential marks in London's high society. He eventually found the right fit in Rose and Archibald Henderson, a wealthy middle-aged couple who were selling a house in the city. Haig went for a viewing of the property, introducing himself as an engineer who'd recently moved to the city. He managed to charm the couple with his knowledge of classical music while he was there. The Hendersons were so impressed that they invited him to play piano at the housewarming for their new place at the Metropole Hotel. Did they move into a hotel? They sold their house to move into a hotel. We just talked about this. These rich people moving into fancy hotels. Uh, sealing a friendship that would ultimately be the death of them. They had unwittingly invited Dracula into their home. It was at this party that Hay got his hands on his new weapon of choice, snatching Archibald's revolver from a chest in the bedroom. Over the following year, the acid bath murderer managed to worm his way into the couple's affairs, learning about their various properties and investments in detail, and winning the trust of their social circle with his charming facade. Meanwhile, he set up a new workshop on Crawley Road in Sussex, much nearer the Henderson home in Brighton and stocked it with two large barrels and three jugs of sulfuric acid. Where are you getting sulfuric acid from? I feel like if anyone's buying sulfuric acid, they should be watched. Especially, like, large quantities of it. On the 12th of February 1948, he ferried his new best friends there one by one. Dr. Henderson was first, lured down on the pretense of getting a sneak peek at Hague's uh, Hague's new invention. When he drove Mrs. Henderson down, he told her that her husband had taken ill and was asking for her. Really, his body was lying dead in the storeroom. Hague had shot him in the back of the head with his own gun. Mrs. Henderson met the same end the second she stepped inside. In the, I, I don't know if it's the last episode that you've heard but the last episode i recorded someone like used a legal defense of it wasn't my gun he shot he shot his girlfriend with her gun and his defense was it was her gun it's like dude (laughs) criminals are dumb mrs henderson met the same end the second she stepped inside with the couple dead, Hay cut an incision into each of them with his penknife and drained their blood into a glass. After enjoying a nice fresh draft, he heaved the Hendersons into separate barrels and left them dissolving overnight. When he returned the next day, Haig discovered that the process hadn't quite been as successful as before. Apparently, his new supplier had been cheaping out on the acid because a few chunks of human remained in the deep red broth, including the better part of one of Mrs. Henderson's feet. That is so grim. Haig thought himself pretty much invulnerable at this point, though, so he decided to dispose of the barrels as previously planned. The neighborhood cats would surely take care of the rest. That is some sloppy, sloppy criminal behavior there. Come on. While, Henderson, while the Hendersons were busy soaking into the soil on a patch of waste ground near the workshop, Haig put his forgery skills to use once again to take control of their estate. He began with a letter to Rose's brother, Berlin, explaining that she and her husband had to leave the country, leaving their good friend John to settle their affairs in the UK. Understandably, Berlin was not convinced, but the silver-tongued vampire had cooked up a convincing story to throw him off. He explained that Dr. Henderson had been caught performing an illegal abortion, so he and his wife had decided to flee to South Africa. With the brother placated for the moment, Haig managed to net a cool £8,000, that's £335,000 today, disposing of the couple's assets, and even kept their dog as a souvenir. <sighs> All right then, psycho. His final victim. 
Once again, you'd think that'd be enough money for Haig to retire overseas and leave his blood-sucking ways behind, but his gambling habits got the better of him once again. He burned through the bulk of the Henderson fortune in about 14 months, once again falling back on petty schemes to make up the deficit in his spending. In June of 1948, one of his cars was found at the bottom of a cliff after he reported it stolen. He, no he took his now fiance Barbara to the cliff shortly. He's still, <laughs> he's still engaged with this Barbara woman this whole time? Or is this a different Barbara woman? Wasn't the first wife called Barbara? No, Beatrice, my mistake. New person enters the picture. Uh, he took her to the cliff shortly after and explained how he had rolled the vehicle off the precipice himself in order to collect the insurance money. That probably got him a few more hands of blackjack, but shortly after, he once again found himself in dire need of cash. Over the next year, yeah, I mean, car insurance payout is not going to be the same on a car you own, is, and then you don't have a car anymore, is not going to be the same as, you know, taking someone's entire life savings of the equivalent of over 300 grand in today's money. Over the next year, John dug himself deeper and deeper into debt, taking out loans just to pay off his other loans. His fiance was growing suspicious, and the image he had carefully cultivated of a worldly successful modern gentleman was starting to slip. By this point, Haig was a familiar face at the Onslow Court Hotel, and he had in integrated with the little community of other long-term residents there. Among them was 69-year-old widow Olive Henrietta Olivia Roberts Duran Deacon, but we'll just call her Dee Dee for short. Yeah, also, she's got a mad long name. In the UK, people with mad long names they tend to be rich. If you've got like two surnames or three surnames and seven middle names, it's like you probably have money. Dee Dee, like all the other residents, was under the impression that her neighbor was a successful inventor, so she came up with a proposal on the 14th of February 1948. So he's a, a successful inventor? It seems like such a bizarre thing to make up because surely people are going to ask you, well, what did you invent? <laughs> She had come up with a prototype for artificial fingernails and wanted to know if he could develop them into a full-fledged product. A few days later, on the 18th, Haig told her he had done some tinkering at his workshop and wanted to show her the results. The two hopped in his car and drove to Crawley, where he pointed the old deer towards a stack of bogus patent documents on the workbench. You basically already know what's going to happen when she leaned over to inspect them. Gunshot, cup of blood, acid bath, bed. Yeah, this guy's way too chill. When Dee Dee's absence was noted at breakfast the next morning, Hay told the other residents that she had never shown up for their meeting at all. The day after, he even offered to go down to the police station with a close friend of Olive named Constance Lane. At the station, they were met by Sergeant Lamborn, who quizzed Haig on the meeting he arranged with the missing woman. The sergeant was suspicious of his dodgy alibi from the start, so she took a dive into his file after the pair had left. She discovered the so-called inventor's history of fraud and began an investigation into the true circumstances of that mysterious meeting. The next morning, the fraudster returned to the scene of the crime to pour out the remains and arrange the sale of Olive's personal effects. Dude, if you're caught selling these personal effects, and you're caught, like, you're going to get so busted so hard. It was a meager haul compared to his previous jackpots. The items included a fur coat, good condition, somewhat bloodstained, a bit of loose change, a handful of jewelry pieces. All in all, John only got around £110 for the lot. But to make matters worse, that dastardly Berlin Henderson was stirring up trouble again, asking the police to track down his sister so she could claim a family inheritance. When he mentioned the name John Haig to the cops, they quickly made the link to the recent disappearance. This meddling put Berlin right at the top of the acid bath vampire's kill list, if he could stay free long enough to pull it off. By the following Saturday, the police had gained permission to break open the door of the workshop. Inside, they found an empty barrel with a hat pin at the bottom, a rubber apron, gas mask, several small, several glass vessels with a little acid left at the bottom, a 38 caliber Enfield revolver recently fired, and a dry cleaning receipt for a black Persian lamb coat of the exact kind the missing woman used to wear. Dude, I, I, this isn't as bad as some of the stuff we've seen previously, but, you know, hide the evidence of your crimes. Just a, a little. Especially after you've come so close to being busted. It's like you go to the police station, you file a report, and you're the person they expect to have a meeting with. They're definitely going to pull your record, and they're definitely going to find you were a fraudster, and they're definitely going to search your workshop. Come on, dude. The casual criminalist. Tips for criminals. Was it bravado, stupidity, or plain laziness that led him to leave such a treasure trove for the detectives? Well, it was probably a mix of all three. On Monday, the 28th of February, the police were once again waiting at Haig's hotel. On the pretense of another routine inquiry, they brought him in for questioning. At first, he was aloof and uninterested, taking his time to smoke a cigarette, read the newspaper, and take a nap while the investigators prepared their strategy. When they finally got around to questioning him, the vampire sensed from their questions that they knew more than they were letting on, but at the end of the day, even if they knew every single detail, there was nothing they could do. He had the Corpus Delecti trump card. Oh yeah, I totally forgot about that. He thinks he's, this is why he's leaving all that stuff around, because he's like, there's no body, no crime, I'm innocent. 
This is why he's a terrible criminal, because he's, he thought this was a real law. How does he think this works? Be like, yeah, no, I killed them. What are you going to do? There's no body. It's like, dude, there's loads of other evidence. You're going to prison forever. When is this? Maybe we'll even hang you. That would be great. When left alone with the Executive Inspector Albert Webb, John asked him, Tell me frankly, what are the chances of anybody being released from Broadmoor? Broadmoor being one of England's most notorious maximum security psychiatric hospitals. Webb refused to discuss the matter, and John replied, Well, if I told you the truth, you would not believe me. It sounds too fantastic to believe. Haig pondered for a moment before deciding to lay all the cards on the table. Like a cheesy superhero villain, he confessed his master plan in one extended monologue, intox intoxicated with the power of his own genius. Starting with that poor prison mouse and ending with Mrs. Durand Deacon, or Dee Dee, he, he gleefully gave the detective a full timeline of his murderous spree, the highlight of which has to be, I will tell you about it. Mrs. Durandi can no longer exist. She has disappeared completely, and no trace of her can ever be found again. I have destroyed her with acid. You will find the sludge, which remains at Leopold Road. Every trace is gone. How can you prove murder without a body? Well, John, let me tell you a little thing or two about the criminal justice system. A flaw in the plan. Yes, indeed. As it turns out, Haig would have done far better brushing up on his Latin before hitting those legal textbooks, because then he might have understood what his favorite catchphrase actually meant. Corpus delecta doesn't mean no body, no crime at all. It literally translates to the body of the crime, but it shouldn't be taken at face value shocking. What the term relates to is the need to prove that a crime actually occurred before anyone can be charged with it. For example, to charge someone with Grand Theft Auto, you have to prove that a car has gone missing. Consider it the most basic building block of a prosecution's case. In that same vein, before someone can be tried for murder, it has to be proven that a murder has taken place. Note, that does not mean a literal body is required, just that some proof of a killing has to be available to present to a jury. Dude, in your workshop, there is definitely enough of this stuff. That's enough to satisfy the body of the crime requirement, even without the presence of a literal body. Just imagine John's face when this was explained to him by someone with a proper understanding of the law. After all, he had just that minute admitted to all five of the murders we've witnessed, along with three more which were never proven, two women and a young man. He even pointed the cops towards the sludge remains of the last three. It's like, oh no, I've made a mistake. On the 1st of March, forensic pathologists moved in to scoop and scrape all this evidence together. Wearing thick rubber gloves to protect themselves from the residual acid, they then sifted through the dirt in the vacant lot, which was peppered with various fragments of human remains. You may want to pause now if you're eating meat. Have you paused? Okay, let's move on. On the top side, they found a gallstone. Oh, come on. Really? Which, matched the, which marked the position he had dumped the bodies. Digging deeper revealed two more of these, along with 12 kilograms of human body fat, a chunk of left foot, 18 bone fragments, a lipstick container, a bag handle, and a pair of fully intact dentures. Even though I'm not eating, this is so horrible. Poor Olive's dentist later matched these up with her dental records, and pathologists were able to reconstruct her foot to perfectly fit inside one of her shoes, like a gritty, noir reboot of Cinderella. Let's never make that movie, Callum. That movie should not exist. As you might have guessed, a puddle of human is more than enough to satisfy the requirements of corpus delecti, rendering John's get-out-of-jail-free card absolutely worthless. Rather than slipping the net as he had expected, the fish had thrown himself right into the fisherman's boat. Whoops-a-doodle! <laughs> Trial and death by hanging. <laughs> Spoiler alert. But Haig didn't let his own idiotic blunder get him down. When he was dragged before magistrates in Sussex County on April 1st, 1949, he was in a cheery mood, cracking jokes throughout the initial hearing. Even though the first stroke of genius fell flat, he had cooked up another, which he thought would save him from the hangman. He was to plead insanity and land that nice, warm, padded cell in Broadmoor. Over the lead-up to the proceedings, Haig had prepared his defense by speaking to prison psychiatrists and regaling them with stories of the surreal dreams which he claimed had plagued him from childhood. He talked again and again about drinking the blood of his victims and explain, explained that he was acting on the perverse urges from his nightmares which had spilled over into his waking mind. Either way, I mean, like, even if he goes to Broadmoor, like, and he does seem a little bit insane, um, that's not going to be a good time. And also, I believe... Often, it's uh, insanity is not often used as an excuse, at least in the U or a defense in the UK, because if you are insane and they commit you to a hospital, there's no definitive end to your sentence. You can be there until you are sane, and if they judge you never to be sane, you're never going to leave. So it's rarely something that will be pursued. And also, this is like 1940s mental institutions. 
I imagine they're much worse. I've seen movies. But the psychiatrist saw right through his new plot. His ranting sounded suspiciously like someone who had skimmed through a psychoanalysis textbook rather than a genuine rather than the genuine troubles of a madman, so they refused to give him the diagnosis he needed. With that in mind, it's possible that he never even had those dreams or drank any blood at all. These might have just been little white lies to paint himself as a lunatic rather than a plain old murderer and a thief. Yeah, that actually seems pretty smart, and I did forget. Uh, importantly, the thing about going to Broadmoor here is like he's not going to prison for life. If he's guilty, he's going to hang. So if he wants to survive, I mean, they're not going to kill him in Broadmoor. It was later revealed that Haig had befriended a worker at a Sussex psychiatric hospital and spent hours quizzing them on the details of various mental illnesses. He was probably just preparing for the latest performance in his long line of cons. Really, his crimes were committed purely for profit, or perhaps partly just for the thrill of the deceptions. The judge and jury saw right through this latest con. Acting for the prosecution, Sir Hartley Shawcross convinced the jury to reject the insanity plea, as Haig's crimes were very clearly premeditated with the goal of material gains. Just minutes into the deliberation, the jury returned their verdict, guilty as hell, to use the official legal term. And so, the acid bath vampire was sentenced to death by hanging. There was no way he could con himself out of this one. On August 10th, 1949, the day he was due to die, one of the jailers offered the vampire a glass of his second favorite beverage, brandy. Haig replied, Make it a large one, old boy. Minutes later, he dropped to the end of a rope and his neck snapped. The acid bath murderer was dead. Good. <laughs> Wrap up. This was the inevitable outcome of Haig's superhuman bravado and sketchy understanding of the finer points of Latin terminology. The killer, who thought himself cleverer than the law, had been well and truly screwed by his own assumed invulnerability. Because realistically, if he had known just how to manage his money and his pride, there's every chance he might have gotten away with it for much, much longer. While plenty of criminals in history have been able to get off on technicalities, like our German Robert Wins Hassan and Ebiso from a previous episode, I think this one proves it better. It's better to keep loopholes as a backup rather than building your whole plan around them. The acid bath vampire lived a hundred different lives throughout his time on Earth lawyer, inventor, chemist, and more. But behind it all was an egotistical, mean spirited killer, happy exploiting the trust of others before erasing them from the world entirely. It goes to show that you can never really be sure that you truly know someone, so if your mate ever invites you down to his basement workshop to show you something cool, you better be on guard. And cue the basement jokes. <laughs> there are all those Business Place fans listening or watching. Worst case, you might end up chained in the dark, writing for an online docuseries. <laughs> Send help. Quiet, Callum! Dismembered Appendices Berlin Henderson wasn't the only person to get a lucky escape from the acid bath murderer. Not long after killing the Hendersons, John noticed the obituary of one of his old schoolmates in the paper. He planned on visiting the man's grieving mother and utilizing her grief to rob and kill her. Unfortunately for Haig, the elderly Mark died of natural causes before he could darken her doorstep. 2. The John Hay case was one of the most sensational news stories, stories in mid-century Britain, giving the papers plenty of candid details to shock their readers with. Sylvester Bolum, who was serving as the editor of the Daily Mirror at the time, even ended up serving three months in prison on contempt of court, his punishment for calling Hay a murderer before the trial had concluded. Whoa! Wait, that so he was getting contempt of court for calling him a murderer? Because it would bias the jury? Three months in prison? That is harsh. He runs a, a the Daily Mirror is like a, a, a very tabloidy newspaper that will print big headlines of outrageous things. That is very surprising to me. Number three. Ever the egotist, one of John Haig's last acts on earth was to send a package to Madame Tussauds Wax Museum on the evening before his execution. He knew it would be featured in their Chamber of Horrors installation, a rogues gallery of killers and psychopaths, and he gifted them his favorite green suit and red tie. They obliged his final wish, and Haig's wax dummy was dressed in those clothes right up until the entire exhibition was discontinued in 2016. So this has been an episode of The Casual Criminalist. If you liked it, you know what to do. If you're watching on YouTube, use that like button below. Also, if you're uh, listening to this as a podcast, why not give us a review? That would be fantastic. Whether you are watching or whether you are listening, you can definitely subscribe. So please do that. And uh, I'll be back real soon with another episode that hopefully will involve less cannibalism. That would be nice. And less acid. <laughs> and maybe just some straightforward murder. Thank you for listening.